Let's get started with my talk, how to obtain progress in payments. Uh, there are two ways to think about uh, what is happening in the field of payments. The first is an inclusion perspective. The next is a growth perspective. Uh, in the question of inclusion, it is useful to think of three groups of people in India. There is one group that has a mobile phone and is already plugged into modern finance. There is a third group that has no mobile phone and no modern finance. By and large, it's very difficult to do much about the inclusion problem for this third group. The real sweet spot is a middle zone. These are people who have a mobile phone, but at present are not connected into modern finance. There is a lot that we can do with this group, and that should be where we focus. Now, let me quickly run through some ideas that are fairly well understood and fairly well accepted by now. The first is that payments is the absolute key to uh, financial inclusion. Uh, the intuition is that poor people use payment services a lot, and once we have databases about the activities of poor people. It will be possible to understand their uh, financial situation, the risks that they face, and uh, be able to do new things for them, such as being able to deliver credit. So if there is a man who is selling fruit and we see all his payment activities, we know something about his cash flow, we know something about his risks, and we are able to deliver loans to this person. So payments plus the analysis of big data will be transformational. The third uh, point, which is again fairly well understood, ever since 1998, where Surendra Dave pushed the design of the new pension system into the direction of using more computer technology. If we want to serve poor people, we have to use more computer technology, not less so as to be able to drive down the cost. Uh, the cost of a uh, transaction tends to be a fixed cost, and when we are doing small value transactions, that fixed cost is killing. And only by using computer technology in amazing ways and innovative ways do we have a hope of breaking through this constraint. The fourth point is that cash is a curse. Cash is expensive and Doing anything involving cash just ruins the economics of doing finance. If we are to go anywhere in terms of cutting down the cost per transaction, we have to eliminate cash. And the last point is that uh, when we work in India, we have to think in terms of ridiculously large system sizing. Compared to what you might see in Sweden, compared to what you might see in uh, most places in Africa, the magnitude of IT problems that we see in India is just out of this world. We need to plan for that and it has consequences on how we think. This does not mean it is a bottleneck. We can do it. Um, NSC and BSC are in the top five in the world in terms of the number of transactions that they do. Uh, the Indian mobile phone companies are smaller than what you get in China but bigger than what you see anywhere else. So in many areas in India we have built IT systems that are really large by world standards and it can be done but it's something that we have to keep in mind. Now when we think about the financial inclusion problem I think the really important challenge is to go closer to customers to understand the lives of the people that we think uh, should be using this stuff. I think that not enough has been done in terms of going closer to people and understanding who they are what their lives are like and how we can serve them. I think India is very, very diverse and uh, requires an incredible amount of innovation in terms of figuring out how to serve uh, people all across the country. I think not enough has been done in terms of that innovation dimension. Uh, we have been far too statist, far too controlled. Uh, we think we know how these things should work. But in all probability, we don't. We need a much more entrepreneurial, innovative, creative destruction of new ideas so that we will figure out how to serve people all over the country through diverse business models. Okay, let me turn to the growth perspective. Just like we care about inclusion, we should care about growth. Okay, roughly 20% of India is working in a pretty modern and globalized sector. And that part of the world is completely different from the old India. 
the modern sector actually matters disproportionately. Almost all GDP is made in the modern sector. Almost all growth is happening in the modern sector. Let us not forget that no country ever got rich by redistribution. If we are ever going to power our way out of poverty, we have to nurture the modern sector. We have to make it work. Uh, this is the old image of India. This is an etching from the famine in Bengal in 18, 1877. And this is the India which is on the minds of many people. But this is not all there is to India today. In fact, India is now a $2 trillion economy. We do things like this. We build bridges across uh, the sea in Bombay. Uh, this is your friendly neighborhood cafe coffee day. Well, look at the top left. This is a cafe coffee day outlet in Vienna, in Austria. Cafe coffee day is now a multinational. Uh, this looks like your friendly neighborhood uh, tea bag. Well, read carefully. This says blended and packed in the Czech Republic using imported ingredients for Tetley, Australia. Okay, dot, 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 go on to the bottom. A Tata enterprise. The house of Tata is running a global multinational. This is your friendly neighborhood Flipkart man. There's a whole new world of e-commerce opening up all around us in India. Uh, we have to understand what are the issues faced by the modern sector and figure out a payment system that will serve them. Uh, here are some examples of the sorts of things that I think are becoming important. Uh, we need round-the-clock operation. It is an absolute mistake to design payment systems with narrow zones of operation. Um, today in India, NSDL essentially works 24 hours a day. I see no reason why RTGS should not work 24 hours a day. I see no reason why an NEFT-like system should not deliver 24-hour access to transferring money from one bank account to an account in a different bank within one second. We need a whole bunch of uh, open APIs through which payments activities can be integrated into the enterprise IT of companies. Uh, the Indian rupee needs to go into CLS Bank. Uh, this is required because we are now a full-fledged global currency and we need to uh, connect up into global infrastructure in the way that all global currencies are. We need to do much more in terms of frictionlessly integrating e-commerce into web browsers. As an example, I think it should be a real embarrassment that Flipkart works with cash on delivery. Why does Flipkart not do payments in the browser? This is something that all of us should worry about. We need to do much more in terms of supporting international standards. As an example, uh, Everywhere in the world, merchants and customers have a choice of using PayPal. PayPal is just a company, but it's more than that. PayPal is a standard. Uh, we in India need to do much more so that a domestic customer and a domestic provider are able to do payments using systems like PayPal, which is at present not permitted. We need to do a lot more to support modern finance. Uh, NSE and BSC are hubs of a very high number of transactions per day. And uh, at present, the Indian payment system is woefully inadequate in terms of serving these requirements. This is a set of ideas of the sorts of things we need to think about in the modern sector. So in the field of payments, we need to worry about both an inclusion problem and a growth problem. Now, this is a wish list. This is an articulation of the sorts of things we would like to do. How do we get there? What is the policy puzzle and how best can we navigate these policy difficulties and get there. So let me start with what we see as proximate problems. These are the problems that stare in front of us. I'm going to argue in a moment that the solutions lie in solving deeper difficulties, but let's start by looking at the proximate problems. And uh, I have nine key ideas that I think is by now our shared consensus on what has gone wrong with the field of payments. The first thing that has gone wrong with the field of payments is that payments is seen by the present law as being the business of banking. Now that is absolutely incorrect. There is very little connection between the business of banking and the business of payments. It so happened that historically banks used to do payments. But payments is an IT business. Payments is much closer to the work of NSDL 
and NSE than the work of banks. It's the business of moving bits, of moving information, of operational controls. It is not the business of banking. It is not the business of holding a balance sheet. It is not the business of uh, assessing the credit risk of a borrower. All that is what banks do, but that's not what payments is about. Our problem number two in the field of payments is that RBI is pretty motherly about banks. And as a consequence, it has not allowed the more modern IT-centric firms to enter into the field of payments. It has blocked new ideas from coming into the field of payments because it thinks that banks are central to payments. The third problem is that uh, there is a business model issue with banks. Traditionally, banks have not charged for payment services. As a consequence, banks today see payments as a cost center. The attitude on the part of a bank is, why should I spend more money on payments? They don't see it as a business. They see it as a cost center. What is worse, the fifth point, banks make money off float and they don't like it if the money sitting in a current account or a savings account is more fleet-footed. So banks actually have the exactly wrong incentive. Banks would like to spend less on payments because it is a cost center and banks would like to not see effective payment services because the more they can block money in a current account or a savings account, the more money that they make. Uh, on top of all this, if you think that we need innovation, we need new business models, we need the use of computer technology in payments, then banking is exactly the wrong place to do this kind of thing. Banking in India is a sleepy business. It is low competition. It is low innovation. If you're looking for new ideas, banking is not where you're going to get new ideas. The real energy is in the telecom and IT world. But at present, the entire regulatory framework in payments has been designed to be uh, not conducive for non-banks. It is designed to not support competition. It is designed to not support innovation. The Last problem in the field of payments is that we have constructed an NPCI monopoly and that further damages uh, the competitive environment. It damages the ability of the private sector to do what the private sector has to do, which is to innovate. So these are the proximate problems of the field of payments and I think they're fairly well, well understood. Most people in the field of payments know that this is why the field of payments in India has been a failure. Uh, I should right away talk about the problem of uh, financial terrorism and crime and money laundering and so on. Many people claim that we have to be cautious about innovation in the field of payments because we have problems with terrorism, because India now has treaty obligations with the FATF. And I just want to say this is completely incorrect. As long as there is cash in India, any electronic payment system is better because cash is completely non-traceable. As long as people have the choice of doing stuff by cash, you know nothing about what is going on. Recollect that $100,000 was sent by an ISI employee to uh, Mr. Muhammad Atta who organized the 9-11 attacks. How do we know this? Because it was a wire transfer, because this money was sent in an electronic system. That is what made it traceable. If the same $100,000 had gone as a suitcase of cash or as a suitcase of gold ingots, then it would have been completely non-traceable. So anything that moves on an electronic system is superior to cash. We should always say that electronic systems are better than cash. Now, we can debate how to make electronic systems better, but we should never ever block an electronic system on the claim that uh, we have a problem with terrorism or we have a problem with our obligations to FATF. That is simply incorrect. Now this whole environment of an RBI that is motherly towards banks, of banks who are not keen on the success and growth of the field of payments, of an NPCI monopoly and of a completely wrong-headed approach to FATF and uh, crime and financial terrorism has given us a policy climate of basically blocking progress. We just don't allow new things to happen. Um, people in the field of payments are pretty gloomy. I repeatedly meet uh, practitioners in the field of payments 
who say that this is the worst industry that you can possibly think of in India and they would much rather step out and do other things uh, where they have more opportunity to use their imagination and be productive as individuals and as companies. I want to say that we should not always be so gloomy. India has achieved change. India has been able to make progress in related fields. Let me show you an example which was the revolution in securities markets. Uh, not so long ago, India had a horrible securities industry. We had floor trading, we had repeated payments crises, we had uh, governance difficulties in the Bombay Stock Exchange. But within 10 years, we got a complete revolution. Uh, today, NSE and BSE are ranked 3 and 5 in the world by number of transactions. These are really world-class exchanges. They are the envy of the world in terms of what they do. We have completely eliminated physical share certificates. I want to point out we have managed to eliminate physical share certificates, but we have failed to eliminate physical money. Think about it. In 1996, if I told you that the physical share certificates would be completely gone, you would have said that's science fiction. But in 10 years, we did it. Why is that so hard to do with physical money? It is possible for us to move to completely electronic systems. It is possible for us to stop printing money. And by the way, uh, this is not a mad idea that I'm making up. Uh, I have been reading that in Sweden, serious people are now saying that the time has come for the central bank to stop printing currency notes because the adoption of electronic systems in payments is now so pervasive that nobody is using physical cash anymore. That's the sort of policy objective that we should be going after. We should be saying to ourselves that five years from today, I want the complete elimination of all cash in the country. And how do we get to that objective? And I think that this kind of objective is actually feasible. Uh, this is the famous uh, nighttime satellite picture of North Korea and South Korea. The same people, two different policy frameworks, and you can obtain dramatic progress in one and abject failure in another. And that's how I think about what happened with securities, where we put new approaches to policy into place and we got a South Korea. And that shows us the contrast with the North Korean parts of Indian finance. And we should be embarrassed about those areas and we should be going and changing them. So how do we make progress? Uh, I think the first element of the picture is to see that while banks were an important part of the field of payments, in the future, progress in payments means getting banks out of payments. And here is a key insight that uh, makes it possible to do this in a very clean and elegant way. The idea is called separation of client funds. Let me start by describing how we do separation of client funds, either in the field of securities or in the field of money management. When I give my money to a mutual fund for the purpose of managing that money, that money never ever goes into the balance sheet of the mutual fund. It does not go into the balance sheet of the asset management company. It sits separately in a trust. Client money sits in a trust. The mutual fund manages that money from a distance, but that money never belongs to the mutual fund. So in the event that the mutual fund goes bankrupt, nothing happens to the client money. That approach can be applied exactly into the field of payments. So let's think of Airtel. Airtel is a mobile phone company. We want them to do mobile-based payments. But you don't want the client money ever getting mixed up into the balance sheet of Airtel. So how do you achieve that? You set up a separate trust and all client money flies only in that trust. So money goes from person I to person J only through this bankruptcy remote structure of the trust. Now, what's the regulatory framework that you need? You need only one check on the part of the regulator. Is client money kept at all times in a bankruptcy remote vehicle away from the balance sheet of the payments provider? That's the only one point that the regulator needs to verify. Other than that, he does not need to know anything about who the payment provider is. And if I may point out, 
the payment provider does not need to be a bank. This entire activity of mobile-based payments needs to have absolutely nothing to do with a bank. So once we achieve this, we can completely break away from banking. We can get that process of breaking down the Berlin Wall and achieving a sophisticated economy. Now, how would you go about doing this? Uh, the present approach is that uh, all of us are supposed to go sit in front of RBI and plead uh, that regulations should be written in a better way. And uh, RBI stands up and says, no, we are fine as we are and we are not going to change our regulations. And we've been trying this for 20 years and we have failed. It's important to look one deeper. Why does RBI write bad regulations? Why does RBI fail again and again and again on the policy questions about drafting regulations? The trouble is the laws are the problem. The behavior of RBI is shaped by the Payments Act and by the RBI Act. And the problem is in these laws. These laws do not produce good behavior from RBI. These laws do not enjoin upon RBI to behave in the right way. Let me show you some illustrations of what is wrong with these laws. Here is the preamble of the RBI Act, which was designed from 1914 to 1934 and enacted in 1934. Read the uh, second paragraph. In the present disorganization, disorganization of the monetary systems of the world, it is not possible to determine what will be suitable as a permanent basis for the Indian monetary system. But whereas it is expedient to make temporary provision, dot, dot, dot. So you see in 1934, the RBI Act was designed as a temporary provision because the authors of this act thought that it is not possible to determine what will be the permanent basis. Okay, that may have been a wise view of the world in 1934, but it is a catastrophically wrong view of the world in 2013. Today, we cannot make do with a temporary provision of monetary policy and today we know how this stuff has to be done. Look at the preamble of the Payments and Settlement Systems Act 2007. Okay, let's read it carefully. This is an act to provide for the regulation and supervision of payment systems in India and to designate the Reserve Bank of India as the authority for that purpose. Okay, think about this carefully. What is this act doing? This act is a statement of power. This act is a statement of turf. It says payment is the turf of the Reserve Bank of India. It says absolutely nothing about what this power is to be used for. It does not specify economic objectives. It does not say that we need to worry about consumer protection. It does not say we need to do prudential regulation. It does not say we need to think about systemic risk. It does not say that we need to serve the people of India. Nothing. It does not specify objectives against which the activities of the Reserve Bank of India can be tested. It does not take you towards any notion of accountability. It just says, this is the Jagirdari of the Reserve Bank of India. And sure enough, when you go down into that act, you see that this act is only a statement of power. It has no objectives. It has no economic purpose. It has no accountability. It is no surprise that this act has laid the foundations for the failure of the payments industry in India. Here's an example of the sort of low quality thought that went into the Payments and Settlement Systems Act. Section 25 of this act has been mechanically copied from the Negotiable Instruments Act on the subject of bouncing of checks. Now let's understand checks. When you write a check uh, and you give a check to a merchant, that check is a piece of paper that is an implicit promise that the money will be paid to the merchant. Now this merchant trusts you. He becomes happy when he gets a check on his hands. So he gives you some goods. And later on when the check bounces, that is fraud. So the Negotiable Instruments Act has made that punishable by two years of imprisonment. And this entire thing has been mechanically copied into the Payments and Settlement Systems Act of 2007. Now that's a completely incorrect transposition of a physical world idea into an electronic system. Let's think of what happens in the electronic world. I try to make a payment which is bigger than the money that I possess. Within one second in an electronic system, it fails. 
The other guy sees it instantly. In a half decent electronic system, which is not the present Indian NEFT, but in a half decent electronic system, we would be able to make a payment from a account in one bank to another account in a bank or in a mobile based payment system or in some innovative internet based payment system that has absolutely nothing to do with a bank. We'd be able to do that within one second. So if I was trying to pay money to a merchant and if I made a mistake and I did not have that money as clear funds in my account, within one second, the other guy would see it and he would not give me the goods. And that's it. It ends there. There's no fraud. There is absolutely no consequence in an electronic system of uh, trying to make a payment which fails. Here's the consequence of the present text of the Payments and Settlement Systems Act. The act says that if you try to use a card and it fails, so for whatever reason you try to use a debit card and you don't have enough money in your bank account, by the provisions of this law, you can be jailed for up to two years. And the burden is on you to prove that you did not get the goods. And Section 28 wants the RBI to prosecute every single such case all over the country. Now, this is just completely wrong. You know, I don't know what these guys were thinking when this law was enacted in 2007. Here is an example of an RBI order uh, which has been drafted under this act. It says that the Reserve Bank of India has refused the authorization application of some company, Zoha, to operate a payment system, dot, dot, dot. See the second para? This is what flows from Jagir Dari. It says that the Reserve Bank has refused the authorization application in exercise of the powers conferred on the RBI under the PSS Act. There is absolutely no reasoning. There are no facts. There is no evidence. This is not a reasoned order. The RBI gives no reasons. It has absolute godlike power. It issues this one line letter and it says to Zoha that you cannot do this business. And what is more, this cannot be appealed. This is not rule of law. This is a dictatorship. And this is what we should never do in uh, the functioning of economic policy. So I think we should ask the deeper question. Why has India failed in the field of payments? And I think the answer is that when we try to obtain progress in the field of payments, we are doing guerrilla warfare under a fundamentally broken framework. Um, we have made mistakes in the way we have designed the house. And uh, day after day, we are trying to get around these mistakes in painful, clumsy, inefficient ways. And this is no way in which we will ever build a nice structure. What we need is a breakthrough. Uh, the beginnings of a breakthrough are now visible. Uh, this is a very important project in India, which is called the FSLRC. It stands for the Financial Sector Legislative Reforms Commission. Uh, from 2005 onwards, we've had a series of very important government committee reports headed by Percy Mistri, focused on international finance in 2007, uh, Raghunam Rajan, focused on domestic finance in 2008, UK Sinha, focused on capital controls in 2010, and Dhiran Swarup, focused on consumer protection in 2011. These committee reports have created an internally consistent framework on how to think about Indian financial reform. Uh, in 2011, the government established the Financial Sector Legislative Reforms Commission headed by Justice Sri Krishna. For the first time in India's history, it was a comprehensive look at laws and it asked the commission to draft a brand new law that would replace the bulk of the existing laws of India. As a subcomponent of the FSLRC, there was a working group on payments led by PJ Nayak, which did a deep dive into the field of payments. FSLRC has taken an approach of saying, don't fix the pipes, fix the institutions that fix the pipes. So don't get into the details about why regulations in the field of payments have been written in a wrong way. Look deeper. What is the legal framework under which RBI writes regulations? And how do we change those foundations so that in the future, the quality of regulations will be better? This involves clarifying the objectives of financial regulation. It involves writing non-sectoral principles-based laws which place the actual work into regulations. 
It involves thinking about regulatory governance, about setting up the correct incentives and accountability mechanisms for regulators. It involves working hard on establishing the rule of law so that there will be no dictatorship and no absolute power, no jagirdari, but everything will be done in the framework of the rule of law. And it involves clarifying the role of RPI. <clears throat> uh, the FSLRC report was submitted to the Ministry of Finance on the 22nd of March. On the screen there, uh, you see the URL where you can access the report and you can access uh, all sorts of things associated with the report. How will uh, the FSLRC approach solve the problem of payments? Uh, FSLRC does not amend or rewrite the Payments and Settlement Systems Act. It proposes the repeal of the Payments and Settlement Systems Act. The Indian Financial Code is a non-sectoral law. What this law does is establish a framework through which RBI will write regulations. So to every critic of RBI, I say that RBI is an organization with enormous strengths and those strengths will blossom when the right legal foundation is put into place. So with this, I am at the end of my talk. Thank you.